All right, so here we have our amphibole group, um, and we have four amphiboles that are on our list and that we actually have good samples of here. Um, so we have hornblende up in this corner, tremolite down here, actinolite over here, and tremolite and actinolite form a solid solution series. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then glaucophane up in the corner. Um, that was too long for me to write in one line, so that's great. Um, so some common things about the amphiboles. First thing is going to be their cleavage, and um, in general, their hardness is all very similar. So the hardness of all of these minerals in front of me are about a five to a six on the hardness scale. We should be able to scratch some glass. Let's do a quick test on this one here. So this is one of our nicer horn blend samples. I'm gonna give it a go. And so I did make the tiniest of scratches here on the glass. Really tiny, nothing like, you know, what corundum or something like that would do on the glass. A very small scratch, but um, it did scratch just the tiniest bit. Um, and all of these would do that except for some of them are quite brittle. You can see that here by um, just really their crystal habit that they have, this fibrous habit. They're pretty brittle, so sometimes getting a good um, hardness test is a little bit difficult. But let's start up here in the corner with hornblende. So hornblende, uh, everyone likes to call the trash can mineral because it um, ha just has so many available substitutions um, that it can really be made of anything that's around. It's happy to grow in a lot of different environments. Um, and that's why usually when we think of hornblende, it's this dark black color. Um, there's a lot of extra stuff going on in it. But the cleavage helps me identify horn blend really easily because I have two good cleavage planes um, and they should be at about um, a little bit off of a 120 degree. So 56 degrees and 124 in the other direction. So we can see that we have a nice cleavage plane right here. I can see some kind of striations on the top a little bit, a little bit of a step pattern. And then on this side here, I have another one. Now these are a little bit weathered, so don't don't mind this kind of brown weathering on top. Um, there's probably some iron in here somewhere. That's what's oxidizing. But when I turn it like this, I can really see those two cleavage, that cleavage angle right here. So this would be that, you know, 56. And then the 120 would be if we had another one right here. Um, so this is a really easy thing to see, I think, in a lot of these this kind of two cleavage planes that are really easily identifiable. And you can see them even in samples like this that have really nice euhedral crystal faces. When I turn it like this, I can still see that step pattern mirrored all the way along here. Now I can't see both of the angles in this cleavage right now, but I can see that I have one like line of cleavage stepping that's going step by step. And we'll talk a little bit about um, crystal system for all of these, it's monoclinic. And honestly, for all of these, I would think the only one that you may see a really good crystal form of, something like a euhedral crystal, is gonna be hornblende. And actually, this is my own personal sample, and I've, I've never seen a hornblende that actually had a nice crystal form to it, so. Um, yeah, this one's, this one's pretty nice, but in general, they usually look very blocky. But even this, I can see I have a nice cleavage plane right here. That's pretty good. Then my other one would be right there. And if I had a, you know, if I could measure that, that would be there, my um, 124 or something like that. But seeing this kind of like very step-like surface um, with those multiple cleavage planes and it's black and quite reflective and can sometimes have some oxidation. This is all like the common form for um, horn blend. You might get it mixed up with something like a biotite, but this has no flaky layers or anything like that. There's no bookishness to it. Um, it's also quite cohesive. All of these have really similar densities as well. So similar hardnesses between a five and six. You can see that they all have pretty much a vitreous luster. So luster is not gonna help us distinguish between them all. Um, they're all monoclinic. They, for the most part, would have that nice two planes of cleavage. Um, and they all have really similar densities. So 
moderate density. It's not light or anything like that. Let's get down here to tremolite and actinolite. So these two form a solid solution series, tremolite being a magnesium rich end member, actinolite being an iron rich end member. And I've kind of oriented these with color in mind because color is the number one thing that I use to tell okay, am I maybe looking at something that has more of a percentage of tremolite or more of a percentage of actinolite? When I think of something that's very, very um, tremolite rich, I'm at that far end of the solid solution series, um, I would expect it to be really light. So really light in color, I'm missing that green chromophore. Um, and you can see here that you'll see in all of these, the tremolite and actinolite series, um, we have this kind of fibrous bladed growth, like it's radial, but from multiple directions, because I have this one that's coming this way, this one that's going this way. It's kind of a mess of these bladed crystals. And if I look really closely, I can't see any like obvious breakages, which is something that we will see when we look at like silimonite down the line. Um, I've also got some oxidation here. This kind of coloring is not from the tremolite itself. Um, it's probably uh, it's dirty. There's something near where the sample was found. So then let's look. I've added maybe a little bit more actinolite to the system. Now I'm getting these kind of green colors. Even when I look at these, let's wait for it to focus. I can still see that like bladed growth that sometimes is in a nice direction. Other times it's in a wonky direction. Let's look at a larger one here. This one's really nice. I mean, wow, gosh, actually, yeah, these are great. So um, this kind of bladed crystal habit is really common. And so something like this, if you said actinolite for this, just because it's so green, this is what I would consider to be actinolite. Um, this one over here, tremolite. So you can really go by color with these because um, they're all going to have really similar crystal habits. Then let's look at this one because these, this is a little bit darker. I would expect this one to be just pretty much straight actinolite. We have included so much iron into this. It's really dark. It's a lot more difficult when it's dark to pick out those crystals too. So if you have something like this, um, where you can see a bunch of crystal faces compared to something like this horn blend over here, I've got one direction, right? I have these beautiful planes with steps. This one, actinolite, and tremolite are both going to have this like complex matrix of um, bladed crystals. So in general with these you can go based on just the color alone. And then that brings us to glaucophane, the last of our amphiboles. Now glaucophane creates one of my favorite rocks which is a blue schist, a glaucophane schist, and these tiny, tiny gray pearlescent minerals, that's what we're actually looking at. If we had really big crystals of this, it wouldn't be so like fibrous and pearly looking. It would look a lot more like the shininess of this actinolite here. Um, but this luster actually almost comes out pearly. It looks a little bit slightly metallic, but we have this like fibrous and it's like almost blue like a very light lavender blue. Um, this is really common in glaucophane and it's a common metamorphic mineral which creates glaucophane schists like I was saying before. Those are blue. They're just sky blue colored. They're so pretty. Um, but getting really big euhedral crystals of this is just not something. We just don't have that. Um, it's very common for them to be small and to be rock forming instead of being euhedral crystals that we can easily see. But this kind of sky blue color is unique to this mineral. So glaucophane, you can use color for this as well. In general, I think for the amphiboles, color is really helpful. And likewise with the pyroxenes, that cleavage that we talked about, having those really nice two planes of easy to see cleavage at, you know, almost 6120, but more like 54, 126 or what have you. Um, that cleavage is going to be something that we use in a microscope as well, and that helps us to distinguish amphiboles and pyroxenes in thin section too. So using color to label these is great, and they all have that cleavage pattern. 
Um, and I think we have covered everything. Hardness, uh, specific gravity or density, they're all monoclinic and really colors what does it for the amphiboles.